I'd like you to welcome back for the round table all the speakers that you've seen so far today. But I'd also like to introduce you to three speakers who we have tomorrow morning, as you know. Um, the first talk in the morning tomorrow is going to be by Rob Walker, sitting right in front here. He's from the Mizzou Department of Anthropology, and he's going to talk about partible paternity or multiple beliefs about multiple fatherhood, biological fatherhood, among people living in lowland South America, which he's published on. Um, second talk tomorrow is going to be by Teresa Kelly from um, University of Wisconsin at Madison at their Department of English. And she's going to talk about um, people's ideas about plants and um, humans and the different forms of kinship and analogies people used to illustrate and discuss plants and relationships with plants in the 18th and 19th century. Is that accurate? Relatively so? OK. And finally, the third speaker tomorrow is going to be Bernard Chappé a primatologist from the University of Montreal, and he's going to focus on how, essentially, how we get human kinship out of primate kinship, what there is about human kinship that's preserved from primates and what changed, and especially about the incredible importance of this for the evolution of human sociality and modern human behavior and social relationships. So with that, I'd just like to open it up to the audience for questions, and please feel free to ask questions of particular speakers or questions that might stimulate uh, discussion across speakers. And more often, once we, they may start uh, speaking to each other on their own rather than speaking so much to us. All right, I always like asking questions when nobody else is asking questions. Uh, this is just kind of an open question to, to everyone. And I've really enjoyed all the, uh, the lectures, and you guys are doing amazing research. It's really interesting results. And my question kind of comes from just my general education so far, and, and has to do with how research is used. And, and there's sort of this kind of the death of the author concept in literature, where once somebody has written something and they send it out, it's read by somebody else, and it becomes not theirs anymore. And with research, it kind of seems to be that same effect, is once you've researched something, you get your results, you publish those results, at which point they become the property of the people who are using them, who can then use them in ways that maybe you as the researcher did not intend. Uh, and that can be taken a lot of different ways. So I guess my question is, for you as researchers, how big of an effect has the different possibilities of how your research may be used by others uh, affect you in just your day-to-day -day thinking about your, uh, <laughs> your, your research, if that makes sense. I'll, I'll give a, one, one response to that, not really answering the, uh, the, the question, but my own ex um, experience. Um, so the talk that I gave was about um, an, an evolutionary conflict, you can think of it as a metaphorical conflict within the genome between genes of maternal and paternal origin. And so that's happening inside the, the bodies, the brains of males and females. And so for over 20 years, every time I talk to the press about this, um, I say this is not about the battle of the sexes. This is not about sex differences. It's not male-female differences. This is happening in both males and females. And I dutifully say that, and without fail, when it gets published in the, the press or talked about on the TV, it's the battle of the sexes does this or that. Now, sometimes when I call the journalist out, they say, well, the heading of the article is written by somebody then who interviews you. Um, and, and the way, and then I've been called out by, um, you know, historians of science or, or similar people who are saying, you know, why do you scientists always phrase things in the struggle between the sexes or something? You know, why, why, why do I frame my work that way? You know, and I can say, well, I don't, but it, um, that's, that's the public perception out there. You know, I don't feel that there's you know, no matter what you say, it's going to be misunderstood or, into, you know, everything you say in general conversation is not, is understood by the people listening in their own ways. So I don't feel too responsible for how these things are perceived out there. But when asked, I will try to explain what I mean, my, um, what I mean myself. <laughs> 
another component of, of the issue you raise is, is just who our audiences are. And I, I think much more in science than in things like uh, authorship of fictional materials. In one sense, you really do relinquish possession of it when you put it in the public arena. It's, I have discovered something or I have done a certain kind of experiment. I put the strength of science is its um, public, cooperative, um, cooperative in the abstract or, or in the collective, hopefully eventually, nature. And, uh, and it's, you put it out there for other people to build upon or refute. Um, if somebody thinks it's important enough to try to replicate it and replicate it successfully or fail to replicate it at some point. I mean, obviously, scientists being human beings, they get, they get into priority disputes. They get annoyed when somebody else gets cited for what they think they should have been primarily cited for and all that sort of thing. But, uh, but by and large, um, you really do let go of your work by publishing it in science, I think, more than, than perhaps in the humanities. Um, just to speak from the social science side of it, I think everybody has stories of times when they feel they've really been misrepresented and you react in probably bad ways to that. M my sort of pet go-to story for myself was being interviewed about sex-selective reproductive technologies, ways to sort between um, um, X, XX and XY uh, uh, embryos for implantation for, for pregnancies. and. Um, in the, in the US, they had come up with this concept of family balancing, that if you have a child of, who's already a boy or already a girl, you can use it to select for one of another, for, for one of the opposite sex, um, though you, you shouldn't be using it unless you already have an imba gender imbalance in your family. And I gave a big old answer to this, to this reporter in which I said, well, the expression is genius because it combines bloody, bloody, blah, blah, and bloody, bloody, blah, blah. And the only bit they quoted from me was, Professor Thompson thinks sex selection is genius. So everybody has that kind of story where they just, and you go in your hole, you just don't want to talk to them ever again, um, which is you know, exactly the opposite of this kind of openness to, to replicability. And I know all the, well, at the science at the moment is in a crisis of, of uh, replicability that all, all the big um, funding organizations and things are trying to make us do much more of that, so, which I think is basically a good idea. Well, as someone who is in the humanities, I recognize this phenomenon as well in one's own work, uh, in the work that I do. On the other hand, I've thought as I've grown older um, that some of the surprising things that happen in teaching have shown me that there is a way that the work that I do, the observations that I make, the things that I build when I publish, that I also then introduce uh, in other contexts are there to be taken um, and, and worked with. In fact, that's the most public part uh, of my intellectual life. And I've come to see that as in some ways far more critical than I understood when I was a younger scholar. So. From my perspective, you know, it's not the death of the author. Author, I'm alive and kicking, but um, it certainly is a willingness to let go. I think that was Martin's phrase, and I think that's a good one. Um, you don't want to be misunderstood, and you don't want to be misread. Uh, but on the other hand, if you've offered tools for thinking, with um, you're on the plus side of that exchange. Um, I agree with Carries and others that you, you, there are times that you just can't escape being misrepresented because even though it's, it's academic work, it's still news and there's still the desire to sensationalize it on the part of the, of, of the journalists, even though they may not say that. Um, I know papers that have been published where you know, the, 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 the scientist gave one title and then it was changed to another title because that title was deemed to be more attractive or um, uh, more sexy, as they say. Um, but I, I think it's up to us as the, the ones who produce the knowledge to, to do whatever we can to make the corrections when we see that our work has been misrepresented rather than just thinking that there's nothing you can do. I mean, write a letter or do something because it will continue to happen unless there are repercussions 
in terms of what journalists and science writers do. I think they will continue to do what the popular press does uh, in terms of our work. So we have the responsibility to make corrections where corrections need to be made. They, they, they won't always make the corrections, but sometimes they will, and, and they will appreciate it. So I'm going to switch topics um, and bring up a word that was only briefly mentioned all day, um, and that's grandparents. And as you can imagine, as I've aged, this word has become much more important to me than it was formerly. And I would, uh, it seems to me that that's something that we don't often think about in terms of lots of the topics that we're talking about today. So for, for example, um, Conflict uh, between genomes, does that extend to the, back to the grandparental generation? What do grandparents think about ancestry or reproductive technology? Um, do zoo animals recognize their grandchildren? Uh, and so forth. Um, on the, so, so on the specific subject of do these parental conflicts go back at a genetic level more than um, one generation? The short answer is um, yes, it's theoretically um, possible, um, but in terms of do genes have a history of their grandparental origin, um, we don't know that that's the case, but people haven't really looked for those sort of, um, those sort of effects. Um, there is a lot of interest in human evolutionary biology on the role of um, grandparents and on their effects on, their, on the survival of their, their grand offspring. And, you know, I could give a, you know, a detailed discussion of a lot of that work, but definitely within the human field, it's a very, very human evolutionary biology field it, and anthropology field, it's a very, very active area of research. Um, in reproductive technologies, grandparents tend to be very big supporters. They're often very invested in genetic offspring for their children. Um, and uh, also they, from early days, have been very involved in part as participants in reproductive technologies as surrogates for their daughters or their daughters-in-law who might have, might have uh, lost a uterus because of uh, cancer or something. Um, or as an, even as egg donors at, at times. So there, there, is quite, there are quite a lot of intergenerational effects, some of which I've written about. Thank you. And <clears throat> as to whether animal primates, in fact, I'll talk about primates mainly, recognize their uh, grandparents, get, recognize their grandchildren, they certainly do. They favor them in various contexts. They will, for example, aid them in their conflicts. They will share food with them, which is rare. Uh, unrelated individuals don't do that. Uh, sisters will do, will do that. Mother and offspring will do that. Grandparents will do that. Aunt and nieces, that's a gray zone. Sometimes they do it, sometimes they don't. It's like as if they didn't know if they were kin. Cousins, they don't do it. They, there's a gradient. Uh, the, the less you're related, the less cooperative you are, the less altruistic you are. But grandparents are really um, special. There, there's a mother-daughter bond and there, there's a grand maternal grandchildren bond. These are two strongest bonds in, in primates. Maternally related, not paternally related because very often they don't know their fathers so they don't know their grand, uh, their uh, paternal grandmothers. In terms of ancestor testing, the study that I talked about today um, the average age, well, the age range was 20 to 87, I think. The average age was 57 or 55, 50 something. Um, so there's, at least for that study, I should say, there's clearly uh, a, a, a bias in terms of older people who, who attended those forums, at least. So we're getting ready to do a national survey, um, a, a representative survey of the population. And we asked that question on the survey. So we'll see when we get the data um, what people think and, and if there are age differences. Yeah, but we asked, it, asked specifically if people are grandparents on that survey. Uh, this reminds me of something I, I did mean to say to Charmaine. I'll, I'll mention it now, although it's off the grandparental topic. 
when you mentioned that you're planning to do a national survey, and I, I gather it's going to be partly a survey of who's interested in pursuing these things and why. Mm -hmm. um, one, one thing that would be interesting and possibly um, revealing to ask is their birth position within their natal families. I mentioned during my talk that I had a student who had been studying some birth order effects and that uh, middle-borns having less parental support. One of the studies she did was to ask who, um, who produces genealogy, family genealogies. And the way she did it was to get these compendia of family genealogies that sometimes get published in little towns like Antler, Saskatchewan. She got the collection of all the local family genealogies. And then you can ask who, who, comp who puts together these genealogies. And because they describe their whole family, you can see if certain birth positions are, are overrepresented. And the finding was basically, as with other signs of sort of interest and kinship, that firstborns were much the most likely to do it, lastborns were second most likely, and middleborns almost never seem to pursue this exercise. So I wonder if the same would be true for ancestry testing, or if it's sort of different, which it might well be. Yeah, that'd be interesting. We ask about the family, and we do ask about the family historian, but we don't ask about birth order. That might be an interesting question. <laughs> In, in terms of um, looking comparatively at the issue of grandparenting um, beyond the world of primates, you know, one of the challenges is identifying species that are sufficiently long-lived that they are, they are living long enough to have you know, adult children who are procreating while they are still alive. And um, we actually briefly went into this and tried to, to sort of find out where most examples were. And we found several in the world, of, in the bird world, um, some species of birds that, for example, um, will create territories for their adult uh, children, their adult offspring, not children, their adult offspring. Uh, and they actually maintain and forage for and essentially are, are gifting them this territory that then becomes theirs. And they are presumably reproducing at that point. Um, and then another, another interesting uh, bird example was the, um, the training of the, of the, uh, uh, by the parent uh, of the certain calls that then were unique to that parent-child, uh, that parent-offspring relationship that endured into the adult life of the uh, offspring. Uh, which was used uh, for warning, for signaling, you know, resources uh, that presumably were then being used to the advantage of the offspring's offspring as well. Sort of. Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed the the whole uh, workshop or talk. But my my specific question will go to Dr. Thompson, if I still remember the name very well. Uh, I might have missed it during your talk. Um, how prevalent the um, issues with the mitochondrial DNA is. And then um, uh, you also talked about the three-person um, uh, three uh, scenario. Uh, I just realized that it can easily get complicated because we can easily move from three-person to four-person or even five by introducing a surrogate mom you know, who carry the baby. So in, the whole, in, in this whole picture of assisted reproductive, I always see an element that we tend to focus on the um, genetics of the, uh, you know, the, the maternal or paternal genetics. And we also forget about the um, epigenetic component that is coming, the imprinting that he was talking about, which can be easily brought about in the, uh, the surrogate mothers. And I've always worried about um, uh, with such cases also in the sense that uh, naturally when you have mutations, it was a way of eliminating certain traits in the population because usually such people defect, with those um, uh, mutations will not be able to propagate and pass their, you know, their, their mutated genes uh, uh, along. But with this technology coming in, it means we're helping these people with these uh, mutations. Isn't, it, isn't there a risk that in the future we might see an increase in abnormalities, even within our own human species coming up as a result of this? I don't know whether you got my questions <laughs> really well. <laughs> 
Thank you. There were, uh, at least to my ears, there were at least three or four questions there. Um, and a lot of good observations. Um, I, I don't know what the incidence of mitochondrial disease is, and I should. Um, the, the, there are fewer poster children for it, than, but there are a few prominent ones, um, including a girl called Lily in San Diego, um, than there are for many of the diseases that are very well organized in the patient advocacy <coughs> world. Um, uh, in terms of the multiple parenthood, uh, in terms of patients, they tend to, or, or several will, will play up the biological and physical connectedness through um, as gestational, if they're supposed to be the one who ends up with the child. So if they have a donor egg, then it'll be very important that it was in their body that they provided, whether through some epigenetic mechanism or whether through just the force of environment, whether, whether or not one can sort those two out or not. Um, so whether or not there's a known mechanism or whether it's more equivalent to nutrition, that they'll still, that still cling quite closely to that, that making them somehow part of their family. Um, whereas when it's when it's a, when you're being a surrogate, unless there's a custody dispute, and then you get a falling back across into the other role. But when there isn't a custody dispute, surrogates who give up or whatever they wouldn't call it giving up, but who who the baby is transferred to the intended parents, tend to downplay it and talk about what a small amount of the of the uh, biological identity it is. And uh, this is, I guess, very important and very similar to the general kind of kin narrating we do all the time with ourselves to say why we care about who we care about and looping one another in and talking about who we resemble and uh, it's a kind of narrative that a lot of rehearsing that we do of kinship recognition and kinship affective life all the time but that goes on around sort of this biological demarcation um, and you're absolutely right that there's a, a proliferation in general of parental roles an absolute explosion of the number of parental roles and many people do argue and indeed there is evidence particularly for male factor infertility that you that it can be um that you can pass it on so men who could not get pregnant quote unquote naturally couldn't get their wife's partners pregnant naturally um can now with things like intercytoplasmic sperm insertion um, produce a viable embryo and that their partner can have a child but then the male offspring can is one particular example of where they can then have the same problem. Thank you for your question. Well, I, I was actually going to comment on intracytoplasmic sperm injection and the male infertility problem. Um, so this is offered to males who don't produce motile sperm, and so basically a, a needle is used to put the um, sperm <laughs> into the egg. So one of the situations is males with deletions on the Y chromosome, um, which, and those genes on the Y are required for sperm function, and so all of their sons will also be infertile and will be unable to um, conceive in the natural way. Now, when the parents are asked about that, um, they, they usually respond that they believe that by the time their son comes to have child that the problem will have been sorted out. And as a geneticist, I doubt that that's going to be the, um, the, the case. Another thing that's happening in the male infertility is one major cause of um, male infertility is absence of the vas deferens, and a large proportion of those males have mutations in the cystic fibrosis gene. And so this is a situation where a, a known deleterious mutation, these are males who would have been infertile, are pa potentially passing that gene on to their um, offspring. Now what's done at the moment in that case is because the frequency is so high in the male partner, they actually test the, um, the female partner, whether she's also carrying the cystic fibrosis gene, so, to, um, so that to minimize the chance that the child will be affected, um, but all in all, you're putting a higher proportion of, of these deleterious genes into the gene pool that's, you know, potentially causing affected individuals some generations down the line. I'd like to direct this question to all of you. I think perhaps Martin and Bernard will be as the more psychologically oriented uh, Folks up there will maybe be most uh, apt to, to jump on it, but I'm interested in your take on the evolved psychology of how we humans perceive 
this notion of kinship and where that's going now that we have these technologies to understand the ultimate basis for kinship, looking at genes um, as you know, the specific entities, the mechanisms. So our ancestors didn't evolve with knowledge of DNA and yet we have cognitive abilities that allow us to think through what these consequences are. Um, and so presumably the way we attack and address these kinds of questions should be influenced by this evolved psychology. If you give me just a second here, I want to veer off just a bit to another example of this. Uh, I guess I'm sort of claiming my own kinship in a funny way here, as proud fathers sometimes do. But um, uh, in some ways, uh, my oldest son asked a similar question of Mike Roberts, um, who's a, a famous biologist here who gave a, a big open lecture on one of our Saturday morning things on stem cells. And it was a big excited audience uh, because the, the question of stem cells then was very hot. And uh, the question my, my son asked, which was uh, I don't think quite understood by Mike, but uh, the gist of it was, so what you're saying is if you take human DNA and you put it into a cell that comes from a mouse, um, that this is objectionable uh, because we're somehow violating some ethnical standards of, of where the human soul is coming from. So somehow our belief in God or the human soul is encoded in the base pair sequences of the human DNA per se. And you know the the response in the audience was just remarkable. Um, and uh, it was just, I think, one of those nice examples of uh, maybe how we're not really prepared to think about those kinds of questions now. So I'm really curious how you all, uh, where you see it going in terms of the use of genetic technology and how that fits then with our evolved psychology for understanding kinship in the first place, if that makes sense. I'm not sure I entirely get the point about the, uh, the, the you know, question about religion in the genome, but I think I understand the first part of the question, uh, which it's, it seems to me that as, as somebody from psychology with a strong sort of evolution-minded enthusiasm and the notion that the, the mind slash brain is full of all sorts of funny little special purpose devices shaped by, by selection, my prejudice is to expect that, uh, that there will be, you know, an evolved psychology of kinship with many special components, that, that the, the task of being an offspring is different from the task of being a sibling, is different from the task of being a father, and so on, and that there's bits of dedicated machinery um, for, for solving these problems in people as there are in other animals, I imagine. Um, in the case of people, we have this interesting phenomenon of what is sometimes referred to the jargon as, you know, certain kinds of um, psychological inferences are or are not, quote, cognitively penetrable, by which people mean they do or don't actually respond to information in non-ancestral formats. Can we incorporate this information into? And so an example of the kind of thing I'm thinking of is there is an argument because um, paternity has been uncertain in human evolutionary history, whereas maternity has not been um, statistically mistakable in the same way that males should be more sensitive than females to um, self-resemblance or resemblance to known kin in their affection towards children. And there's a little bit of evidence in the adoption literature, I'd like to see this better addressed, that non-resemblance to the adoptive father is more strongly predictive of adoption breakdown than non-resemblance to the adoptive mother. Um, these people know perfectly well that they are not, I'm talking about adoption by stranger, by non-kin. These people know perfectly well they're not the parents of these children, and yet if 
male affection for children is simply more responsive in some way to self-resemblance than female um, resemblance to children is, then, then you could have this interesting kind of phenomenon. On the other hand, you know, we also know that people have a lot of their sense of who their kin are and from information given to them verbally, from what trusted individuals tell them. And, uh, and so it's clear that to some extent our kinship models are very penetrable by you know, um, explicit information. We must be buffeted to some extent against being manipulated by these things. I mean, kinship metaphors are very interesting. The, the brother can you spare a dime, the evocation of um, you know, kin metaphors where we're trying to elicit some, or, or at least we're trying to make more salient to the other person the fact that you and I have a commonality of interest, rather analogous to that between kin. Hear me out, brother or sister. Um, and it must work a little bit or people wouldn't do it, but we must also be buffered in some ways against being complete manipulanda of other people, you know, pulling the wool over our eyes by calling us brother. Um, so so there's, there's an interesting tension and problem in to what extent um, kinship feelings, the sentiments appropriate to, um, to genetic relatives um, can and cannot be manipulated by this kind of, of, of social phenomenon. And to, to the extent that we are capable of incorporating information, things that were told um, verbally, it seems very plausible that cultural changes and, and technological changes in what can be known are going to change the way people feel quite strongly. And yet, you know, there's, there's these things like perhaps self-resemblance mattering more to males than to females that might be rather robust and non-conscious, non-verbal, non-articulatable. He said everything he was to say <laughs> in a very nicely way. I, well, the, somebody yes. was going to ask a question, but you know, let me, let me speak up for friendship and non-kin interactions. We, I, I think people often feel more comfortable with, with their good friends than they do with their families. And I suspect that part of that is, is that the kin interactions are non-contingent. Your child or your brother can treat you really badly and not respect you, and still you have some sort of obligations to them. Whereas your interactions with non-kin and friends, you know, it's mutual, mutual good behavior. And so there's a certain degree of trust that you can have in relations with non-kin, because you understand that the relation is contingent, than sometimes exist in interactions within the family. I have found this just so interesting, and I, I know you folks are so way above my education level here, but um, I find it very interesting that we have all these different ways of finding things and studying. And like with M, with Albert Einstein and his his studies and stuff, he never meant for his studies to be used badly. I mean, I, from different things that I've read, he was, was very hurt over the idea of the bomb and the devastation that it, was caught, that it caused. Just because we can doesn't always mean we should. Where do we draw the line? But also, how do we protect it? Because I think everything that's been said today is so important. So how do we protect it from turning into um, going through and pulling everybody out who has 50% or less of Native Americans and throwing them on one continent and separating them out? How do we, how do, we do this and still be, still be human, still be uh, sensitive to each other and stuff and and grow. How do, how do we find that balance of growing and not hurting? Thank you. Was that for me? <laughs> I, I guess so. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll start out with that one. Uh, that is an excellent question. And as one who studies bioethics um, and, and what we do with, my focus is what we do with genetic information. 
um, but primarily as it relates to, to, to issues at the intersection of race and genetics. Um, and the, the whole field of ancestry testing and ancestry inference, even when we use it in research, raises a lot of those kinds of questions. What happens when we, when we identify people who we think belong in another group? Um, and, and it's still a big open question. I mean, our desire is that we won't do anything untoward with that and that we will um, treat people with respect, but the, the information doesn't always stay with those of us who generate the information. Um, and that is the challenge. And the privacy of people's information, who has access to information. And these days, that is an even bigger question than it always was, because nothing is private, really, <laughs> anymore. Um, and people are recognizing that. People in the public are recognizing that. Um, and, and are becoming even more open to uh, becoming less concerned about some of the things that we used to be concerned about in terms of protecting information. But they still want you to protect it to the extent that you can. Um, and so the question of how, what we do with this information that we generate, and um, even in ancestor testing, the companies, um, there are times that one company gets sold to another, and there are people's information that's in the database, and questions about what happens to that information after people have sent their, their samples in and the tests have been done. Um, and we still don't know a lot of that, what happens to that information. Um, so there are a lot of things that still need to be done to safeguard, just speaking spe specifically about ancestry testing information, to safeguard that information and to ensure that it doesn't get into the wrong hands and that people don't use it um, in, in ways that, that would, would um, ways that would harm people. And uh, ancestry testing in terms of the, of the industry focuses on individuals. But then we, when we think about inferring ancestry in research, we see things, um, uh, you know, research that link one group with another or not. Um, there's research that link the Lemba, which is this group in, in South Africa, to Jewish, to Jewish ancestors. And they believe they're Jews. Um, and the question about whether the Jewish community in Israel sees them as Jews and, and will accept them as citizens. I mean, that's still a big open question. Um, so what happens to people's well-being as we generate this kind of information? There are lots of questions there. I don't know. I don't have an answer, um, but you raise an excellent question in terms of where the technology is taking us and what are our ethical responsibilities and what are the boundaries um, around that information, what we can do with it and what we don't. And just, just to add to what Charmaine's saying, um, and maybe I can pick up on this clever boy who asked this question about you know, whether putting human DNA in a mouse cell, why that matters, or does it matter, and if so, why, and what's the basis of that? Um, it, this question of when, when, when should you do things just because you can that you raise comes up all the time with um, assisted reproductive technologies. Um, and people who have critiqued the technologies have had a range of concerns from, and often one of the characteristics of that question actually is that you often get these unlikely bedfellows. You get people from the opposite ends of the political spectrum coming on the same, coming together to contest. So you get people who are on the left who really want to protect the humanity of the sort of what they often call the human futures and they might be very concerned about chimeras, about germline um, genetic modification. Um, they might be very concerned about what they call playing God. And then on the other hand you have people, you know, Republicans who are introducing bills to stop pe putting human cells into non-human animal cells um, with a, a biblical warrant. Um, who, uh, you know, and whose views are much more socially conservative, and the concern there is, is, is not to, uh, is to protect a certain, a certain kind of specialness or a hierarchical view of the species and so on. So you get these very different views. But certainly there is a very widespread sense that just because you can do it, you sh that doesn't mean that you should. Um, and I think one thing that's really important to bear in mind is that um, people tend to say, oh, the technology runs ahead of the social. But that isn't true. 
the technology, the social often runs ahead of the of the technology. They loop around, so people are having incredibly ro um, exciting, excited social imaginaries that are very future oriented. At the same time that they're having technical things, and the policy always lags behind. It lags behind socially, and it lags behind scientifically. Um, but but there is there's there's some way in which at least habits of mutual reflection and sort of tacking back and forth I think have to be in place and we don't really necessarily have good good um, social democratic mechanisms for that yet. Thank you. So one last question. Well, I kind of drew two observations: one from the more some of the morning sessions, and then one from some of the. So I'd like to just give the two observations, and then ask whether you see any connection between them. From the morning things, and probably from the keynote last night, you know, what I got was the the central power and role of genetic kinship in history in a in a whole its powerful powerful role no matter whether we may now have a, a selective kin and so forth. It's still that, that's the model, the template, and it's still active. And actually, I think Dr. Royal said sort of like, it was like, uh, who are my kin and who are not? And I'm reminded of this line from Little Big Man. The Sioux are human beings, the Pawnees are dogs. Now, this is a comment from one Plains Indian tribe with some st the locale, various, all this guy. So what is that? The other one was, and I and I'm, bless you, Dr. Natterson, actually, because I, I watch a lot of PBS stuff. So I watch some of the stuff about the development of the, the genome. And I can remember people talking about, well, the, the number of human genes must be at least 100,000. We're so special. We're so unique. All of our doctors can work 48 hours and can train to not be stupid and make mistakes. Well, that was always nonsense. We are every bit as part of the natural world, subject to the sunlight. And it's a, you just can't train out of that. But what I kind of got from some of those shows was when it turned out that they discovered that the human genome is like 23, 24,000 genes, that was an unbelievable shock. And there, I, I read things about, so what, how could that work? How could we use the same building blocks can produce a wing, a fin, a this, a, a tentacle, and whatnot, and how all that kind of works. So the report that you gave really kind of demonstrates. So I hope that's the follow through on that. But to some extent, that's the same thing as human beings have thought of themselves as we're so unique, we're so special, and of course, we can speak of this philosophical, religious terms, tradition. And so both of these kind of things address it. So I would ask you, isn't probably the central human educational task, maybe more uniquely for our generation and other ones, is how do you get beyond the natural sense of the Sioux are human beings, the Pawnees are dogs, Human beings are so different that there's nothing to be learned, even though there's this massive overlap in the genome structure across all mammals, not just primates, but all mammals, and on into the reptile, the, the, the bird, all those things are so much the same, and yet the perception of all that kind of has to be relearned every generation. What, and that, I'm, I'm thinking the protection against technology getting, getting ahead is somehow or another that kind of awareness that we are so intimately connected and in some sense in a kinship basis, on the genome basis it's this massive overlap is this central thing that may be our, our long-term only protection against all kinds of overreaching and overreaction. So I'd be interested in your comments about the whether my two observations seem to be similar and whether it's that role of education about this. And of course, that ties into next year's symposium topic. Thanks. I want to say something from the perspective okay, okay. of literature. Oh, thank you. Um, and, and what I want to say is one thing that literary works mark is um, a line of difference that needs to be recognized and tracked.
that that is the that is folded inside the uh, the larger classifying projects um, of literature and also of science. And I, I and I sense very much in the highly particular um, work of genetic study uh, that some speakers at this conference pursue is again um, an effort to understand uh, a surprising set of singularities that continue to come to mind. And I think when, when that is your project, it's, it's impossible or it's logically necessary, hopefully we come up to that mark from time to time, to, to recognize that, that our, our task is not only to congregate kinds, but also to differentiate within kinds, and so that it would be less easy for us to identify another group as just dogs. That would be in the phrase of someone who wouldn't, didn't care uh, about a dog or many dogs. And, and, I, and I think that's important. I think it's important to understand that difference um, is what abides in the human community. We are not all alike uh, as much as we may share, and the respect for that it is, is critical. Well, I just wanted to respond to um, one of the points that the questioner made. Um, you referenced likening fins to hoofs, to arms, and, and that just reminds me of this, um, this wonderful term, deep homology, and which is a term that was um, uh, created by the evolutionary biologists Neil Shubin and uh, Sean Carroll, and, uh, and I'm going to forget the third. Cliff, David, thank you. Um, to describe these very ancient, highly conserved groups of genes that are shared, for example, by tetrapods, be they horses or, or humans or, or others. And um, I love that term deep homology because it, it really um, encapsulates uh, on a genetic level what is um, just a reality, an increasingly emerging reality that we, we are deeply connected obviously to each other as human beings and also uh, to humans and, and plants as well. And so uh, when, you, when you brought that up, it just reminded me of that wonderful term that we like to use. Well, let's give one big more round of applause for our speakers. <laughs>